Tennessee This Week from WATE 6 on your side starts now. Hello and welcome to Tennessee This Week. I'm Bo Williams. Glad you're with us. Well, Tennessee Governor Bill Lee responded publicly last week to criticism that's been building after comments by someone he's turned to when it comes to ideas for improving education. Hillsdale College President Larry Arn. Now, the conservative-leaning institution got a mention in Lee's State of the State address earlier in the year. Lee praised Hillsdale's curriculum in part as a response to what critics on the right see as increasingly liberal and out-of-touch trends in American education. The governor called their efforts a good fit for Tennessee, establishing a civics institute at UT while on the K-12 through level, saying the state would formalize a partnership with Hillsdale to expand its approach to civics and K-12 through education. But then this summer, Nashville media outlets published comments by Arn behind closed doors, quoting him as saying, teachers are trained in the dumbest parts of the dumbest colleges in the country. Teacher groups and even members of Lee's own party were upset, and there were calls for Lee to denounce Arn's words or cut ties altogether. Now, we're seeing counties reject charter school applications from a group with ties to Hillsdale. Wednesday, Governor Lee faced questions from reporters about pushback over Hillsdale. Well, my wholehearted embrace is of, is of the public education system and teachers across the state. But you embrace Hillsdale, sir. Uh, my wholehearted embrace is for the teachers in this state. My words, not someone else's words, but my words have been that teaching is a calling. And professionals that are dedicated to the transformation of our children, those are our teachers in this state. That's what I've had to say about public school teachers. And, you know, there's a lot of conversation about other people's words. And there are a lot of folks who actually don't want choice for families and for parents. And there's a lot of pushback on that. But I'm staying focused on what my view is of the future of public education in our state and my wholehearted, at least, um, positive focus and push toward our public school teachers. And, and, and I'm not asking about Larry Arn's words, but what I'm asking is the school board votes. Why should that not be seen as a repudiation of your vision for Hillsdale being a part of the solution? Yeah, it shouldn't be seen that way because it's not my vision. My vision is to create the best public school system in the country. And we do so by investing in our teachers, which we've done multiple times through pay raises, by creating a funding formula that actually gets those raises to the teachers, the raises they deserve, instead of a bureaucratic loophole that existed before the new funding formula, and the investment of a billion new recurring dollars for our public school system. We, we have the opportunity to be, we have the best and brightest teachers in the country, we have the opportunity to best public school system in the country. That's my vision, uh, that's where we want to go. <laughs> what I want to see is a process, it's not the governor's, it's the process that allows high quality public charter schools into our state. There's a process that makes sure that, that is followed and that determines who comes into the state. So I welcome any and all high quality operators, but the actual decider of who is high quality and who belongs in the state is that process. Larry Arn, by the way, responded in an opinion piece published last week by the Tennessean newspaper, saying his remark, quote, does not contradict my deep and abiding affection for teachers and went on to say, quote, dumb can mean unintelligent, which I did not mean. Dumb also means ill-conceived or misdirected, which is, sadly, a fitting description for many education schools today. A Knoxville police lieutenant has been fired. A KPD captain has been suspended, and we're getting a better idea of why. We told you early last week that KPD's new chief, Paul Noel, had fired Lieutenant Lance Earlywine and suspended Captain Don Jones. The two are named in a summary of the internal affairs investigation obtained by WATE 6 on your side. It shows a black officer claimed that a white officer made racist comments directed at him back in June of 2019. Records show the white officer resigned during an initial investigation the next year, and at first, just one supervisor was suspended for a single day for failing to take action. The black officer later asked for an investigation into three leaders, including Earlywine and Jones. The probe found Earlywine broke the department's code of conduct on truthfulness. 
Early Wine had issued a sworn statement claiming that none of the officers told him about racial comments or a hostile environment, but several officers in the unit told an investigator otherwise, that he had been made aware. As for Jones, there was not enough evidence to say whether he told investigators the truth, but there was evidence that he failed to follow policy on reporting the situation. Now, Captain Jones was suspended for 10 days over that violation. We should point out that KPD's new chief, Paul Noel, came into the job saying he would push for greater accountability, implementing a program to help train officers how to step in when a mistake was being made or a rule was being broken. Noel wrote in an email to the department, quote, we can recover from most mistakes, take the appropriate action, and move forward. Unfortunately, truthfulness is not one of those mistakes. As police officers, we are held to a higher standard. One of those standards is to tell the truth no matter how much it hurts at all times. Chief Noel, in his message to the department, said the disciplinary decision came after great thought and consideration. During a meet and greet last week, he avoided specifics about the cases, but talked about several issues affecting the community, including violent crimes in Knoxville and officer accountability, something he's pushed for since day one on the job. I do not believe in being heavy handed with this one. This one needs to be fair and it needs to be impartial, but this one is a part of what we do. And with every, every action, there's consequences to those actions. We need our officers, we need our employees to look out for one another and prevent mistakes and prevent, prevent misconduct. Chief Noel says his department is focusing on four areas, crime, community, culture, and career development. Knoxville Mayor India Kincannon shared her support for Chief Noel's actions in a statement. She says, I fully support Chief Noel and the disciplinary actions taken following Monday's proceedings. Every city employee, no matter their rank, must be held accountable for their conduct. We are your local election headquarters. Voters will see a longer ballot this year because they will cast their votes in state and federal primaries, county elections, plus a bunch of choices on whether to keep or reject Tennessee judges. With that in mind, Knox County's Administrator of Elections has some advice before you head off to the polls. The big thing that voters need to understand is they're going to get two pieces of paper. They're going to get literally two ballots, if you will, even though it's one full ballot, um, no matter whether they choose a Republican, a Democratic, or a general. And so they just need to be ready to take their time. And I encourage voters, do their homework. Do your homework and, and check that ballot out before you go to the polling place. Early voting runs through July 30th. Remember, in that process, you can vote at any of the county's early voting locations. Now, Election Day is August 4th, but on Election Day, you'll have to vote at your assigned precinct. For everything you need to know about voting in this election, including a full list of the offices that are on the ballot and polling locations, just go to the website, wate.com. Tennesseans will soon see the impact of some temporary tax breaks approved by the state legislature. In August, you will not have to pay taxes on groceries. This covers food and food ingredients, but not alcohol, tobacco, candy, and prepared food. The food tax in Tennessee is 4%, so if you spend $500 on food in August, you'd save about 20 bucks. Tennessee's tax-free weekend for back-to-school shopping is coming up at the end of this month. The tax holiday will apply to things like clothes, uh, back-to-school supplies, and computers. Those can be purchased without Tennessee sales tax. The holiday will start Friday, July 29th, and continue through Sunday the 31st. Still to come, our panel of pundits. Coming up next, you're watching Tennessee This Week on WATE, 6 on your side. We're actually going to go back to last week. We, we talked a little bit about this, uh, Governor Lee and the Hillsdale College controversy. Uh, still a big topic right now. As a matter of fact, we got a lot of feedback from our viewers as well, looking back at the discussions we had last week. So we're going to continue talking because some more things have happened here recently. First of all, two Tennessee counties have now rejected the application from the charter school backed by Hillsdale College, which of course is located up in Michigan. Uh, also, obviously this all goes back to Larry Arn, the comments he made just to refresh our viewers' uh, uh, memories in case they weren't with us last week when he made those comments saying teachers are trained in the dumbest parts of the dumbest colleges in the country. Okay, so two school systems now are saying, mm -mm, we're not going to go with it. Uh, even the governor, who has been asked to distance himself or come out and say something about this, has said, um, maybe distance himself a little bit by saying 50 Hillsdale Charter Schools was not his vision. So are we seeing maybe a little backpedaling here? Courtney, what, what are your thoughts when you kind of hear what the governor's saying now and as this controversy continues? This is absolute craziness. I mean, again, you all had an affiliate in Nashville interview him last week and he had the opportunity to say i don't agree with those comments 
And he said everything, but I don't agree with those comments. It was this weird talk around of, well, people are saying things and I don't think people want choice. And it was just like, governor, all you have to do is say, you don't agree with those comments and you appreciate and respect all of the teachers in the state of Tennessee and all of our institutions that train and coach and educate teachers. That's all you have to say. And the curious thing is his inability to say that, which is going to spark more controversy. And I also think that if he had taken the chance to just say, I, I don't agree with that, we wouldn't be seeing these um, actions come out from various educational institutions and school boards across the state. So it, it's just very curious to me why he hasn't taken the opportunity to simply say, I don't agree with those comments. Michael, you, you had some pretty strong words last time we chatted about this. What are your feelings now, especially now that you hear that there are two school districts who are saying, mm, we're not going to go that way? Well, uh, for starters, I, I want to double down on what I said last week. Uh, his comments were ill-advised. Um, and now I realize that his comments were just dumb. If he was trying to uh, uh, put 50 American Classical Academy charter schools in Tennessee, that was absolutely the wrong way to go about it. Um, Governor Lee handled it delicately, um, and he walked his comments back. That he, now that he's finally made a comment, he's he's essentially saying those those were someone else's words, and they were. Um, he also acknowledged that he doesn't have a vision or never had a vision for fifty American Classical Academy school charter schools in Tennessee. So he's been a little wishy washy. He's been a little political, um, and and Orange comments were just flat out dumb. Craig, uh, you kind of go along with what Michael's saying there. I mean, obviously, the governor has, has had a few comments, but I think what Courtney's saying, too, though, is that maybe he needs to come out and just say flat out, just be get straight to the point. Um, what do you think? I mean, is the, is the governor enough? Does he need to say more? Uh, how everything stands, Craig? Well, I think the time to, you know, walk back his comments or apologize has come and gone. <laughs> I mean, uh, I think what he's doing is starting, he and his staff are starting to read the political tea leaves. And they're seeing that there's a significant brushback to the comments and uh, from members of the state legislature. Uh, there, there's one legislator head of the uh, House Gover Education Committee that said any plans for a charter school from that organization are shattered. And now you have the two school systems, as you pointed out, that voted against these uh, charter schools. But on the other hand, remember that under the new laws, there is a charter commission at the state level that can approve these uh, charters uh, above and beyond what the local school systems want. So it'll be interesting to see if they're appealed to this state board and, and what that board thinks about the decision not to allow those charter schools. It, it, it could be that the governor is simply buying his time to see if indeed there is as much blowback as he thinks there is uh, before moving on out of this. But like I said, I think the time for him to, to uh, strike back on this has come and gone. And uh, to a degree, he owns it now. Uh, and I, I know that there's quite a few people over at the UTK campus, especially in the education department, that are just totally upset with it, what this gentleman said. And um, it, it, it may be a, a difficult thing for those charter schools to recover from. I was like, Courtney, and, uh, was, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, also keep in mind, the lieutenant governor and the speaker of the House came out against these comments in very strong and certain terms. How does this impact charter schools moving forward? Are we going to see, see more charter schools, Hillsdale, otherwise? Uh, you know, how does this impact this? Uh, of charter school, uh, you know, charter schools have not been extraordinarily popular. And at least for this type of charter school with H Hillsdale College, it's got to be DOA. When you have essentially everybody in an elected leadership position except the governor saying, no way, you know, we do not agree with these comments, you're looking at a the political death here, a slow political death. Michael, what do you think here as, as far as, well, what Courtney just mentioned there, but, you know, obviously looking ahead, charter schools, the future, what, 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 how, does this have any impact? I mean, what, what, what do you think is going to play out here? Well, I think I think uh, Courtney's on point in terms of, of this being the kind of situation that needs to be carefully scrutinized. Um, American Classical Academy is off to a bad start. I would not be surprised if several other uh, school systems decide to reject uh, bringing that type of charter school in. 
if charter schools can be good, but we need to make sure that we're doing the right thing for kids in every community. Okay. Craig, uh, we're running up on the break here, but I want to give you uh, one last thought here as well. Well, the charter schools are really concentrated in Memphis and Nashville. Uh, of course, we have the Emerald uh, Youth Academy here in, in Knoxville, which is is could be seen as a prototype for the charter school uh, development in, in across the entire state. But there are a number of charter schools that are successful in both Memphis and Nashville. But there's a number of charter schools that have gone out of business for various reasons. Uh, poor academic performance, poor administration of the funds they receive from the state. So I think we need to do a lot more research on what works in charter schools and and what doesn't. Um, so it, it's it's uh, another step down this. You know, of course, I believe in public funds going to public entities, and that's that's the way I think that the money should go is to the public schools. Improve the public schools so that no matter what your zip code is, you're getting a fine education. We're going to kind of shift our view now and we'll talk about Knoxville Police, where recently uh, Knoxville Chief of Police Paul Noel uh, fired and suspended two members of KPD. Uh, the firing of Lieutenant Michael Earlywine, this was, uh, he said he was violated uh, the truthfulness policy. Captain Don Jones suspended uh, for failing to follow proper procedure on notifications following a harassment complaint. Uh, Michael, let me start with you. Uh, you know, Noel has come in and initially said he's going to he's going to go through the department. There's things he's wanting to change. He's wanted to to put his footprint there. Uh, is this was this the right move out of the gate here? Obviously, uh, after this investigation, the firing and the suspension. Let me get your your feedback. I think it's a good start. I met Chief Noel on uh, Tuesday. Um, he was very candid about his intentions to go through the entire department and make changes where he felt like changes uh, would make a difference. Um, and I want to give him the benefit of the doubt. Uh, these first two actions that he's taking, they are a start, but they are just that, just a start. I'm also curious about uh, his statement that will be forthcoming about the uh, Anthony Thompson Jr. shooting at Austin East. Mm -hmm. um, so so he's, he's, he's going to make an impression very early in his tenure. Yeah, that is true. Uh, Craig, uh, your thoughts following up here with Michael, can I go along with what he was saying? Well, I think we use the analogy of, of the new football coach in town, and he's the new football coach. And I, and I, one of the things I, I, I'm sure he was hired to do was to enforce the discipline in the department. Uh, it seemed to have been lacking under the previous administrations of, of police chiefs. So this is his first step to making sure that, yes, this is what I mean. You follow our rules, our regulations. Otherwise, you pay the price. And, you know, uh, unfortunately, people lost their job and people were suspended. But I think it was the thing that he had to do to earn the respect of the officers underneath him, that the uh, calls for transparency, for discipline, go from the, the patrol level all the way up to the chief's office. So, you know, it's, it's only been, a, what, maybe a month since he's been on. There's still, still a, water, a lot of water to go under that bridge. But um, he's gone a long way towards uh, making sure that discipline is enforced in the department. I'll say, Courtney, he, uh, you kind of go along with that, your impressions uh, after this uh, latest move. When we first met the new KPD chief earlier this summer, spring, my reaction was he seems like a very no-nonsense type of guy. His leadership style seems to be extraordinarily direct and no-nonsense. And his first actions as as the KPD chief match well with that first impression. So I like to say trust is earned, not given when we're talking about football coaches that extends to the KPD chief. And I hope he continues on this trajectory of, of no nonsense. And we've heard rumblings of, of, of issues of racism and sexism within KPD. And it appears that he is taking those seriously. And I hope he continues to do so. Okay. I tell you what, we're going to turn to another topic here real quick. Uh, just to remind everybody at home, when we record this segment, uh, we do this on a Thursday night. So um, today was the day uh, that we learned that uh, the President Biden had tested positive for COVID. Uh, says it's a mild case of COVID, still working, uh, but is isolating. Uh, and of course, this is something we will continue to follow uh, here at WATE. But I kind of wanted to, to, to ask, you know, we see this, the health department this week came out with new numbers. It looks like uh, the number of reports, this latest variant, uh, the, the, the cases are, are going up, uh, hospitalizations back over 100 again. Are, are we beyond, though, turning back the clock, going back to some of the, the, the protocols that we were doing? 
Uh, we just kind of accepted this is the way it is. Uh, and now that we see with the, the, the president as well, I mean, is this just kind of how life is going to be? Uh, Craig, I'm going to start with you. Uh, after, first of all, hearing the president, uh, get your thoughts, but then also just, is this just kind of the norm now? Well, uh, unfortunately for the president, uh, a really complicating factor for him is his age. Mm -hmm. uh, as we all know, uh, COVID in its many forms uh, attacks older people uh, much more than it does the people younger in age. So, you know, I, I certainly hope that he uh, doesn't have any serious consequences from it. And as I've said many times before and a couple of times on this program, we may be over COVID, but COVID is not over us. Right. It's going to be around for a, a long time and it's many variants. Uh, you know, I'm hoping that we come up with a, a vaccine that uh, it'll probably may have to be like an annual vaccine like we get for the flu shot every year. Uh, but it's, it's still out there and there's all sorts of public uh, public health information that's coming out now that about the how we handled the pandemic to begin with like there's accepted science that that masks prevent infection but the unusual thing is that mass mandates don't lower the rate of infection so what is the actual policy that we should adapt in in dealing with this uh, I, I hope we don't get to the point where, you know, there has to be more draconian uh, steps taken because I don't think that people will take them if it's needed. It has to get back up to a crisis level like it was the first several months of, of the original COVID. But, you know, people need to make their own decision about what is their plan to handle this. Is it wearing a mask? Is it not going out? What is the thing that you do to protect your health? Yeah. Courtney, you kind of go along. Does it come back to the individual? I know we have seen in some of the bigger metropolitan areas, some areas have said, you know, uh, whether it's in restaurants or in stores, if you're inside, strongly requesting that you put your masks back on. But, you know, the president had uh, all of his vaccines double boosted, um, still caught it. But again, a, a mild case from what we know right now. So uh, following up on Craig, that you kind of go along with what he's saying, then it's, it really comes down to the individual or does something more need to be done here? Well, what we know about the virus is that it mutates, it appears to become more contagious. And so I think for, for our viewers, and especially in East Tennessee, I don't see us going back. So it is up to personal responsibility. And what are you going to do? The people who receive uh, the vaccine and then get the appropriate number of boosters seem to have a more mild case where it's like the flu and there's a big or mild inconvenience of having to isolate for five days. And then when you do go out into public, into the public wearing a mask. So that's where we are if more people get vaccinated we could see those numbers decrease but you know more people have to get vaccinated especially younger kids as we're going back to school at least in knox county in the next two three weeks yeah just around the corner michael you get the last word on this one uh your thoughts after hearing the president uh, contracted covid and then uh just kind of seeing the, the latest numbers as well from the health department what what kind of thoughts are you having I'm, I'm still very concerned that the, the president had two vaccines, two boosters, and he still got COVID. That, that concerns me. That, to me, suggests that, well, he's got a mild case, but he's still early in, 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 the, in this round of COVID. So we don't know if he's going to have more symptoms or it's going to be worse. Um, and his having all of those vaccines and the booster I'm wondering if the boosters and the vaccines are effective enough that they give the inoculants enough protection. Masks certainly didn't help us a lot. So I just want to see that that um, COVID kind of uh, affects the populace the way the flu does. And if it does, I, th I think we're going to be okay. All right. And I tell you what, that's where we're going to stop it for this week. We appreciate everybody taking some time to join us. And again, we want to thank Michael, Courtney, and Craig, as always, for taking the time to give us your thoughts on some of the big issues. We do appreciate your time. That's it for Tennessee this week. Take care. The views of guests on Tennessee This Week are their own and do not represent the views of WATE6 on your side or Next Star Broadcasting.